Well, good morning, church, and thank you so much for joining me for this first Sunday of Advent as we continue to worship God in this virtual fashion. And as I would love to say that we are planning to be in the new sanctuary next week, and we are hoping to. At this point, we know in the COVID world that anything can happen. And so we hope to communicate with you later in this week for sure the plans of this week. But know that right now, that is our hope and prayer, is that on December 6th, it'll be our first Sunday in the new sanctuary. It is all dressed up and ready to go. So we'll just hope that COVID stays away from our congregation a little bit longer. Before we do anything else, would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. As we remember this season of your first incarnation, Christ Jesus, and the promise of your second coming to this world. Help us to eagerly anticipate all that you have for us and all that you are. Let us set aside our hearts and our minds so that you can come and transform them right here, right now. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I would just ask that as we worship virtually, that you treat this as much as you can like a normal worship service. So make sure your cell phone's turned off, other distractions are set aside, so that you can enjoy this time together in worship with us and experience the presence of God. We do have a few announcements. If you would like to send Christmas cards to Manolo and Rito, our missionaries down in Mexico, please get them into the office or Dan Noor by December the 4th. And we're also doing um, money for hoodies and Christmas gifts if you'd like to support it in that way. Also, the office had been closed this past week due to Thanksgiving and the possible COVID scare in our congregation, but know that we've only had one person test positive at this point, and everybody else that was exposed to that person has tested negative. 
Um, so the office will be open on Monday from 9 to 1, but because of the continued lockdown that we're in, we would ask that if you need anything, please call first if you can at all. And finally, our Advent devotional is up and online. It can be found on our website at rudosocomc.org. Um, if you need a hand or if you need a physical copy of that, please contact Diana in the office and she'll make sure to get you one. I believe those are all the announcements that we have for you this morning. So if you would, please join me in the call to worship. I'll be reading this first unbolded screen, and you'll be responding with the next bolded screen. We are called to wake from sleep. To wake up and hear. To wake up and see. What has the Lord shown to us? A new life. A new world, a different set of priorities, freedom from tyranny of sin and death. Wake up. Wake up. Hear the invitation that echoes down through the centuries. We, we welcome, welcome the way of Christ and find freedom. Amen and amen. Our opening hymn today is Ye Servants of the Lord.
Amen. Thank you so much, Melba and Pat, for playing that. And if you would, and if you are able, if you would please rise and join us as we sing the doxology. prepare us for the next steps that you have called us to live into as we prepare to enter a new building, as we prepare for new and fresh ways to continue to reach the community, as we prepare to continue to impact the lives of people throughout Mexico. Just be with us. Lead us and guide us. Be with those that we love that are sick during this time. Those that have been able to ring the bell for their last cancer treatment suffering with coronavirus, or they just have this nibbles, we ask that your healing hand would be upon them. And I pray that you give us the eager expectation that comes with this time. Help us to remember what it was like to be a child and eagerly anticipate Christmas Day and give us that same anticipation 
for the return of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things, pray the prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So beware, keep alert, for you do not know the time that he will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with their work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crow, or at dawn. Or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us pray one more time. Father, I ask that during this time that you would come and soften the hearts of your children and that you would allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to your Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. I don't know if y'all remember my saying for Advent, but it's people get ready, Jesus is coming. You know, and if you were here, you would have there to still been the awkward silent pause, right? Because it's been a year since we said that. But that isn't the phrase of Advent, that is what we eagerly anticipate, is that people are ready because Jesus is coming. When I was a kid, my mom, on occasion, would leave town without any of us kids or my dad. And inevitably, what would happen was the dishes wouldn't be done in quite the same timely manner as if she was there. Um, my socks would be left around the house. Okay, like my socks would have been left around the house anyway because I was notorious for leaving my socks behind, a trait that I have passed on to my daughter. I think it's a biological trait. Um, you know, laundry would pile up, um, the floors would get messy, 
And we just wouldn't really attend to the chores of the house as we normally would if mom was at home. But what my dad would have us do every single time that my mama would, before she would arrive, was spend hours cleaning the house. We would dust all the knickknacks, we would vacuum the floors, we would do the dishes, we would do the laundry, so it would work. When she got back home, that the house would be as spotless as her husband and three boys could get it, right? Which was pretty spotless on occasion. And that's why it would happen. She would walk home, and she'd be happy to see us, she'd be grateful that the house was clean, and it was all prepared and ready for her arrival, for her return home. This reminds me so much of this text that Jesus talks about here, is that we need to be ready because the master has left the house. But unlike knowing when my mom is going to come back, what Jesus says in this text is that no one knows, no person or no angel, not even the Son, knows when the Son will return. And so at all times and in all places, we have to be ready because the last thing that we would want as a church is that Jesus would come back and he would found our house, our church, askew, right? I mean, nobody would want to, Jesus to return, and what, what are we doing? Like the, I mean, church is just in dismay, we're not loving people, we're not making disciples, and we're just like, whatever, he'll come back tomorrow. But I think all too often in our society, is that's what happens, is that we forget that we need to be eagerly anticipating in all days and all times that Christ will return. Right? That's one of the things that we say in our communion liturgy, is that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will will come again. That means, church, we eagerly anticipate that he will come back, and that's one of the season, one of the reasons that I love this season of Advent, is each year it reminds us that we need to wake up, that we need to stay alert because Christ will come back. I mean, I can't imagine what would have happened if my mama walked in our house and it was a dismay and a disrepair. I can imagine much less what Christ would do. And so here in this story that I've read, Jesus leaves, um, uses this exact illustration of a man, a master, that leaves his household and tells his slaves, look, I'm going to come back, and you need to be prepared for my return. And he does so, and in this story, I think he gives us a couple of things that we need to remember, because people get ready. So, Jesus is coming. Hopefully you said that at home, right? No? Okay, maybe next time he'll say it. One thing that Jesus shows us in this text is that he puts his servants in charge of his house. Um, this NRSV actually says the word slaves. It's that Greek word of doulos that literally translates slaves. And I think that's an amazing thing for us to remember is that when Jesus is using this illustration, he's saying the master puts the slaves in charge of the house. I think in the exact same way, church, this Jesus has left us, the ascended Christ has left us, the church, in charge of his kingdom until he comes back. Yes, he has empowered us by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he has gifted us with so much. But he has said, hey, look, church, you're the ones that are in charge. It's your job to make sure the kingdom is expanding. It's your job to accomplish my will on earth. You're in charge, and I don't want the church to get skewed and messy on your watch. Because I'm going to come back, and you better be ready for that. It's almost like the parable of the talents that Jesus tells right before this. Remember, Jesus gives three different guys different sums of money. We'll say he gives one guy $10 million, one guy $5 million, and one guy $1 million. And then the master leaves, and he says, go and make some money off of this money that I've given you. And then he comes back, and the guy with $10 million, he made $10 million more dollars, and the servant's like, whoa. The master says, well done, good and faithful servant. The one with five million makes five million dollars. He's like, oh wow, you doubled your money. Good job, faithful servant. And the one with one million dollars is like, man, I didn't want to lose a single cent of yours, God. So I didn't do anything with it. In fact, I just buried it so that when you came back, you could get it back. So I think what Jesus is saying is, look, I am leaving you in charge. I've given you a million dollars, and what I want you to do with that million dollars is turn it into ten million blessings. Right? We have a job and a duty to do this time because he has left us, the people of God, in charge of helping to make sure that the kingdom of God is expanded. And so what are we to do? What is our work? It's pretty simple. Hopefully you remember it. We love God. We make sure that we take care of our own selves, our own relationship with him. We love people. We love our neighbors. 
Regardless of their ethnicity, their race, their orientation, their political party, or what teams they root for. And that may be hard for some of us to do, but we love other people regardless of where they're coming to us at. And we make disciples. We make sure that other people are being formed into the image of Christ, are being transformed to look more and more like Him. That is part of our work. He has given us a task, and He has given us each giftings that we can use to make sure that this is done. So if your gifting is singing, then sing to the Lord. If it's playing the piano, then play to the Lord. If it's praying, then pray. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's healing, then heal. If it's preaching, then preach. If it's just going to your neighbor and showing love, then show love. If it's being hospitable, be hospitable. Church, God has given you a gift, and what he longs for us to do is to use that to multiply, to turn it into blessings for other people during this world so that when he returns, he can look at us, his church, and say, well done, good and faithful servant. He has left the servants in charge of the house, and we are his servants. We are the priesthood of believers, not just me, it's not just my job. But we, the church, have a job to do to make sure that our master's house does not get in a mess under our watch. So he says, you, the servants, are in charge. And then he says multiple times, stay awake. Now, church, I'm not just talking about you staying awake during the sermon, which for some of you may be hard, right? I mean, because all you really have to do is hit the pause button, and you can go and take a little nap, and then come back and watch it later. Or, let's be realistic, you can hit the pause button and say, you know what, that football game is a lot more interesting than this sermon right now. So he's not just saying, stay awake for the sermon. He's saying, church, stay awake, be prepared, be alert. In the Roman world, there are typically four watches in the night. Um, Jesus says them, he recounts them in this passage of Mark. He says that they are, let me pull out the Bible again. They come in the evening midnight as the cock crows or at dawn. So these four different times, what the slaves would do in the Roman household is they would go on watch and they would look out to make sure they didn't see anybody coming or anybody attempting to do anything bad to the house. These were the four watches so that the house would be kept safe throughout all hours of all days. And so Jesus is saying, just like those servants, says, we need to be ready. We need to keep a watch, a lookout for what he can do. He tells another parable about this a little bit before, the parable of the ten virgins. I'm not sure if y'all remember that one. It's not as widely popular. But there are ten virgins that are waiting a bridegroom to come. And as they're waiting, they have these little oil lamps that were really common in the ancient world. And five of the virgins brought extra oil in case the bridegroom was late. And five didn't. And when the five that didn't bring the extra oil, when their lamps ran out, they went to the ones that did and said, hey, can we borrow some of your oil so that we don't have to leave? And the ones that had the extra oil said, no, you can't. Because if I share it with you, then I'm not going to have enough, and I don't want to miss his return either. And so those five, they had to scutter to the store. I guess they went to Ossips in the middle of the night, and they bought their oil there. And they came back, and the bride had already, the bridegroom had already come, and the party had started, and the doors were locked. And they knocked, and they said, Master, let us in. And he's like, I don't know who you are. You weren't ready for me. Ooh, That's a tough parable for us, church. Is that what Christ is saying is that we need to stay alert. We need to be prepared because at any moment he could return. And yes, I understand it's 2020, the year of seeing COVID. And it's been almost 2,000 years since he left and since he made these promises and yeah, he'll come back tomorrow, right? Church, I can tell you I've met countless people that weren't prepared for the sudden heart attack that they had that took their lives, for the car wreck of teenagers that took their lives to just freak accidents and people meeting their Savior in a physical world. And um, how many of us are literally ready for His return? If all that we say and all that we do, is it really so that when He returns, He can look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or is it just like, well, you know, He'll come back later. One of the famous cliches of Christianity is, I'm ready to die, just not yet. And I think that's how a lot of this approach is returned is, well, he'll come back, but we're not really ready. We're not really staying awake. 
One of the things about this text, the stay awake, that I find interesting in Mark 13 is actually what happens right after it in Mark chapter 14. One of the things that I was taught over and over again is you can't just pick a text and take it and isolate it. You have to look at what's going on around it. And in Mark 14, Jesus is anointed by Mary. He has um, the Lord's Supper. And then he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And what is the charge that Jesus tells Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane? What does he say? He says, Peter, I want you to stay awake and pray for me. And so Jesus goes a little bit farther away from Peter, James, and John and the other disciples. And Jesus is praying and Jesus comes back. And what are Peter, James, and John doing? Yeah, they're sleeping. And Jesus is like, guys, I just asked you to stay awake. Can you not stay awake? And Jesus, Peter's like, oh, I'm so sorry, Jesus. I'll stay awake and I promise I won't fall asleep this time. I mean, I, that's not what Peter says in the Bible, but I'm sure that's pretty close to his heart. So Jesus goes and he prays again and he comes back and what's Peter and the disciples? What are they doing again? They're still asleep. And he's like, oh my gosh, the body is weak, but the spirit is willing, right? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus is telling his disciples to stay awake. And Mark frames this perfectly because we on this side of the resurrection have the whole picture of the gospel. Right? We know that in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus was in such distraught and such prayer because he was about to go to his crucifixion. We know that Jesus has been raised from the dead. We know that he gave us the power of his Holy Spirit. And we know that he will come back. And so Jesus, even more so to us, is saying, Church, you need to stay awake. You need to be ready. You need to be prepared because you don't know when I'm coming back and I will come back and you do not want to be caught unprepared. So be ready. How are we boy, ready? How do we stay prepared? We keep doing that work. We keep doing the tasks that he's called us to do. We don't let the chores be unattended. We keep loving God. We keep loving people. We keep making disciples. We keep seeking him in prayer and listening to the discernment of the Spirit and going where he tells us to go. Church, we need to stay awake because the world longs to, the world needs to know more and more of God's kingdom. And so people get ready. Jesus is coming. You see, we at church are empowered by the Holy Spirit. God has given us the best gift that we could ever imagine. The Spirit of God living and dwelling in each and every one of us. And our task, our job, is to remember the Master may have left the house for now, but Christ is going to come back for His church. And church, we do not want to be caught unprepared. But instead, we want to be faithful servants of God's house, working on His behalf, staying alert, staying alert. Remember that we have been tasked with bringing about God's kingdom here and now. So we need to keep alert. We need to stay awake because we do not want to be caught unprepared. At least, I don't want to be caught unprepared. And as your shepherd, I don't want us to be caught unprepared. I can't imagine what would have happened when I was a kid if my mama decided to knock a day off of her trip and not tell anybody, and she got home and found the dishes piled high and the clothes smelling in the hallways because three boys, we were stinky on occasion. I can't imagine what she would have thought and what she would have done. Mom, if you're watching this, maybe when we talk later this afternoon, you can tell me. How much more will Christ look at us if he returns to a church that has just forgotten the task, forgotten our calling, forgotten our necessity to serve him? And it is going on doing the mundane things of our church. So church, we do not need to waste a spiritual moment. We need to make sure that our spiritual lives are in order and that we are accomplishing the task that God has called us to do. People, we need to be ready because Jesus is coming. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. 
Father, first and foremost, I just thank you for the fidelity of my parents and their love for one another. And I pray that you help us use our example and be ready. Because we don't know when you're going to come back. We know that neither the sun nor the angels nor any person on this side of eternity knows. Or when you're going to call us home to our eternal dwelling in heaven. So awaken our spirits, awaken our hearts to your work. Help us to tend to our spiritual lives in you. Help us to live out the calling that you have called us to live. Help us to be ready. Because Jesus, we know that you are coming. We ask this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Open My Eyes That I May See.